Hey friends, welcome. My name is Mia Park and this is my interview series called In Response, Interviews with Intriguing Internalizers. Uh, I'm live on my Facebook page and my YouTube channel and I'm interviewing pretty cool people from around the world that I already know, uh, friends and family. Um, and I think that, that not only do I have a connection with my lovely uh, people that I'm interviewing, but also I think that they have pretty interesting things to share. So today's guest is Drum roll, <laughs> Philip Latham, all the way from Sydney, Australia. So, um, Philip and I have known each other for a good 30, 30 years, years, my friend. Oh, geez. Yeah. Not that we're dating ourselves, because uh, uh, Philip and I lived in Seoul, South Korea, in 1990 and 91, and he was teaching English, and I was taking Korean lessons. And uh, we actually played in a rock band together. And we had a couple weird gigs. We played like house parties. Did we play like the American Army Base too, I think? So we had a couple strange gigs, but we it was it was fun. And, and that's how we've known each other. And Philip now lives in Sydney, Australia. And I was in Australia about a decade ago and got to see Philip then. So hello, sir. Welcome. Hello, Mia. Good to see you. Good to see you too. So am I your first Australian in your in response videos? Uh, no? Actually, no. Uh, for some reason, I know like five people in Australia. So you are the fourth Australian person. You're the fourth person in Australia that I've done, but the second Australian Australian. The first one is from Melbourne, but you're my first Sydneyite. What do you call yourselves right. there? Sydney Ers. I thought you may just be trying to get more people with funny accents on your program. <laughs> well, you're the, yours is the funniest of them all. So thank you so much for being here. You're welcome. So, Philip, is there anything else you'd like the world to know about you? Uh, I suppose one other thing is that um, as well as working in education for uh, over 30 years, um, I have a hobby of being a busker so I play guitar and sing in the city of city council and my uh, artist name is the Surrey Hills Barfly. Yeah Philip's so funny on Facebook I'll look and be like oh he's out there busking again um, and let, let me ask, why, why do you do that? Um, it's a hobby I mean I, I upgraded from bass to guitar just before I turned 50 because I thought, my God, I'm going to be 50 and I don't play guitar yet. And uh, went out and bought a guitar <laughs> startup kit. And, and I had a friend who was about my age who was learning to play trombone. And he said, uh, what's your musical goal with guitar? And I thought, do I have to have one? And uh, then I thought, he's right. You don't just play guitar to yourself in your bedroom. Music's about sharing it with other people. So I thought I'd have a go at busking. So I've been doing it for about five years now. It takes quite, I think you'd have to have a very stable ego and obviously love people to play live music on the street asking for money. I mean, that's that's pretty good. It is. But look, the thing about busking is uh, you decide when you play, where you play and what you play. So you're your own boss. So it's very different to being in a, in a band. And um, it's basically consequence free. Like if somebody thinks you're no good, they'll just walk, walk past and shake their head and maybe uh, <laughs> say something nasty to you. Most of them just walk past. So um, it's not like you've got, you know, a thousand people in front of you in a theatre watching you. Hey, man, you know, from performer to performer, I get it, we, you know. So, um, so Phil, there's a couple questions I'd like to ask you, sir. The first sure. one is to talk about... Um, Talk about the outside world, what that looks like for you in Sydney, Australia today, June 23rd, 2020. And then what's your internal response to that outside world? Sure. So I live in Surrey Hills in Sydney, hence the name, the Surrey Hills Barfly. Surrey Hills is an inner city uh, suburb of Sydney. So I'm only a 30 minute walk from the CBD where I walk. So both me and my wife, Rika, who's originally from Japan, uh, been together for 30 years. We both walk into our office jobs in the city. Surrey Hills, is it's not a beach suburb, even though cities are a, a coastal city, but it's an area where there's lots of bars and nightclubs 
uh, and restaurants. And it's also very close to the root of the Sydney Gay and Lesbian Mardi Gras, which has been happening here uh, for 40 years. So it's quite an interesting neighbourhood. Let me just say that you don't uh, choose to live in Surrey Hills to stay at home all the time. So <laughs> now has been a very interesting experience. I mean, to talk about um, Australia briefly, um, did you know that Australia is one of the uh, most urbanised countries in the world, more urbanised than the United States, in fact? 86% of Australia's population uh, lives in urban centres compared to 82 in the USA, but our population density is extremely low, one of the lowest in the world. We have uh, 2.66 people per square kilometre compared to the USA's 31.27. Wow. But also, if I, if I had to choose a unique feature, we have the oldest uh, human society in the world. Indigenous yes, that... Australians have lived here for what's now believed to be about 60,000 years. It used wow. to be about 40. But it's recent amazing. archaeological discoveries have shown that it's up to 60,000 years old. It's amazing, so yes. Ab- it may not, be, may not be unique, but a rare. Uh, we're an island country, so we're surrounded by oceans. We don't share any other land borders with any other country. And um, I think those features as well as having pretty basic public medical care and a fairly good welfare system, have all been advantages in the COVID-19 situation. But I think it's a combination of good fortune as well as good management and good conditions. Mm-hmm. It's a lot of information there. Philip is extremely well-researched. He works very hard at getting, getting prepared. I so appreciate that. That's awesome. So now we got the stats. Tell me what's going on inside of you in reaction and response to the stats, to the stats. Well, um, you were asking about a philosophical or spiritual view. I mean, I don't have a teleological view of the world, so I don't believe that the world is based on a plan from some higher force. Um, I believe that, you know, the universe is basically a, uh, interconnection of matter and lots of living organisms, including microorganisms like viruses. And while humans are highly sophisticated and very unique organisms, we have consciousness, we have language, we have culture, we have art. Um, we are living things nonetheless, and we are mortal and we are vulnerable. And we can put people on the moon and get them home safely. We don't have a cure for the common cold. Common cold is a virus. There are no cures for viruses, as I understand. COVID-19 is another virus. So I think my reaction is that it sort of puts puts us in our place as a, a living organism in the universe. Mm. It sure does. I like the perspective of being interconnected. You know, that it does put us in the place as far as... Uh, being part of the universe, but we are totally interconnected in that way. That's true. Yeah. So I would, um, I mean, there's no cure for this virus. Um, a vaccine's about 12 to 18 months away. So the only way to fight it has been with social distancing to minimise the spread. And um, we're actually now, we've been in our tightest lockdown. They're starting to uh, loosen the restrictions now. So our case count compared to yours just quickly so we've still got 476 active cases we've had a total of 7,400 cases and about 100 deaths 48 of those in New South Wales my home state now the USA has had 2,279,879 cases 119,969 deaths and 622,000 recovered. So while our curve has gone up, restrictions have come in, it's gone sharply down. Looking at your curve, it's gone up and it's kind of plateauing. It's not going down in a hurry. So um, I've actually seen our restrictions now starting to be eased up. Mm. So uh, I'm a little bit concerned about that. 
So you prefer, are you the kind of person that prefers to be physically distant? I don't like the socially distanced term. You're, like, you're a person that like, are you a mask wearer when you go outside? Like what's your re re response to people that are not uh, respecting mask wearing or physical distancing? Well, the mask wearing, interestingly, um, in Australia, it hasn't really been a big thing. Most people don't wear masks. You couldn't buy a mask anywhere. The biggest problem we had just before the lockdown was stockpiling. All the toilet paper disappeared. I know. Why did people do that? It's so weird. It's, it's anyway. Crazy. You couldn't get toilet paper for a month here. And so you weird. couldn't get masks. There weren't enough masks even for health workers. I yeah, that, that was a thing. Yeah. My doctor recently, and he was saying it was really scary that, you know, they didn't have enough uh, masks for the, the doctors and staff in his centre. That, that was a real problem, yeah. Um, the other thing I, we have to talk about in the world right now outside is the long overdue fight for racial justice and at least in America, police brutality. And there, uh, it's a different, if, we, if we're saying black lives matter, you know, in America, we're mostly talking about people of African origin or, you know, um, Caribbean or kind of this side of the world. On that side of the world, we're talking indigenous, like mostly indigenous is defined as black there, correct? Yes. The Black and Lives Matter thing has been a big thing um, in Australia. The, you know, the George Floyd incident has been massive globally. And look, I was seriously shocked by that. I haven't seen anything like that since uh, the Rodney King incident. But this was quite different. The Rodney King, from recollection, was that 90s? It was like 90s, dark, yeah. misty, rain, and you were watching two officers who were basically out of control uh, in anger. This, this recent incident has been caught on high definition and it's just so cold and clinical. It, it's also quite poignant that, you know, the whole message globally now is about the, uh, the the importance of human life and acting in a way where we're going to minimise um, deaths from the virus. And then you have an incident like that happen. Um, so you can, you can understand the, the, uh, the absolute explosion that's happened. Like we've had Black Lives Matter protests here. Um, Indigenous Australians are 3% of our population. Uh, unfortunately, they represent 28% of the prison population. Mm. They had a, a Royal Commission here in uh, 1987 to 1991 into uh, Aboriginal deaths in custody. Their end conclusion was that um, Aboriginals in custody died at the same rate as non-Aboriginals, but the problem is that there's such a larger proportion of Aboriginal Australians in prisons. They made... 339 recommendations, most of which haven't been implemented. They included that custody should be an absolute last resort for uh, Indigenous Australians and that all deaths in custody should be followed by rigorous examinations. Now, since that inquiry, there's been another 432 Aboriginal deaths in custody since 1991. And how many convictions do you think have taken place as a result? Probably of like thousands or something? Since not, 91? Not one conviction. Oh, convictions of their deaths. I thought you meant how many convictions there were of them uh, being convicted to sentencing. Oh, well, uh, that's no surprise. Governments are screwed up. And, you know, I don't know what it is about people who aren't black that want to punish black people. I it's like it's it's some kind of weird primal distortion of justice. I mean, it's happening over there in Australia. God knows it's happening over here in America. It's it's wrong. Whether whatever, oh, I could go on and on and on. <laughs> yeah. And this could be a political talk show, but it doesn't have to be a political talk show. I'm here to yeah, talk well, about you. So, what as, to, as a lifelong. I'm sorry, I, I was going to ask, as a lifelong educator, if you can put on your edu educator's hat, what's your response to the statistics you just talked about? The statistics don't lie. So there's definitely a problem when you've got 3% of the population representing 28% of the prison population. 
there's, there's definitely a problem. And I think, you know, compared with African-Americans, because our Indigenous people are such a small minority, um, they're, they're almost out of sight and out of mind to uh, a lot of white Australians. And I think that's, that's part of the problem. That's changing. Um, I think my generation, we learnt a very different version of Australian history to what people are taught now. I mean, Indigenous Australians basically didn't get a mention in uh, history in my school days. Mm. Wow. Uh, wow. <laughs> you know, when I was there 10 years ago, I stayed with Bob Randall, who has since passed, and he was an uh, Aboriginal elder who was a caretaker of Uluru. And I learned a lot about Aboriginal history and his personal history. He was one of the stolen children. The Australian government right. stole him because he was actually half white, even though he presented as black. They decultured him and he never saw his mother again. I mean, that's what the Australian government did to black then. It's oh, anyway, what to, to get back to the question of you to bring it back to you as an educator, how do you like how do you respond to this 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 injustice there? Is it a matter of changing education? It is. And, uh, I mean, one of the things that's quite common now, be part of the school curriculum, but uh, in most workplaces you'd have to do some cultural competence training. So I had to do a, an online cultural competence uh, training module on Indigenous Australians because I think white, it's important that white people in Australia understand the impact of colonisation on uh, Indigenous Australians, longevity, health outcomes, uh, income, the, the stats are all much worse for Indigenous Australians. So it's, we, we have to acknowledge the, uh, the impact of colonisation. We can't reverse it, but we need to take actions that will uh, narrow the gap, basically. Well, thanks for doing leading those kind of trainings with narrowing the gap. As you say, it takes everyone's efforts little drops at a time, right? You're right. Yeah. And um, I can, my crystal ball is becoming crystal clear. And I have a feeling that you have another way of responding to the outside world. I see a guitar strap around your shoulder. That's right. And I see you wearing a badass shirt. And I believe there's a guitar somewhere involved in there as well. For what does this portend, my friend? This is my uh, Gretsch Projet Electromatic that I bought in Japan. So I use this uh, when I busk, which I've been doing for about five years now. So, I mean, one of my biggest outlets during the lockdowns here, I've been working from home since the middle of March, and so is my wife. Uh, we've both been working at the same dining table in the uh, in the living room of our one-bedroom apartment, something I never thought I would have been able to tolerate. But it's amazing what you can put up with. But uh, after I finish work, I go and go into my bedroom where I've got my little music studio set up, a digital piano, uh, microphone stand, guitar, and uh, I play guitar. And I've lately been doing my own uh, backing tracks in in uh, Garage Band. Nice. And uh, I, I, a little birdie told me that you seem prepared to honor us with the song. That's right. I thought um, if I come on here talking about being a, a busker and I don't do a song, then it's going to be pretty weird, isn't it? So I think I've got to, <laughs> got, to, got to do something. And what I wanted to play was Folsom Prison Blues. And I just, if I can just talk briefly about why. It's one of my favourite songs. Uh, it's one of my favourite songs because it's one of my father's favourite songs. Um, we grew up listening to him playing Johnny Cash around the house. And, you know, you kind of go in one of two directions with your parents. You either follow them or, or reject what they like. But uh, Johnny Cash has always been cool for me. And um, we actually played this song at his funeral when he died five years ago. And myself and my four brothers and my two nephews were carrying the coffin out and we all broke into song as we uh, we let the coffin out playing this song 
Um, wow. The other thing I love about this song is I think this is a real great song for the times because Folsom Prison Blues is about a man uh, lamenting his loss of freedom and being trapped in a physical environment. Now, it's different circumstances. He's there uh, from his own acknowledgement because he's done wrong things. But that loss of freedom and the lamenting the loss of freedom is still the same. And I love the train motif in the song. So, you know, you would know being a musician and an American that one of the biggest inspirations for the blues was the sound of the steam trains chugging along. I think Folsom Prison Blues has got that steam train energy and rhythm to it. And it's a, it's a constant motif in the song that he hears the whistle from the train. Yeah. And the train represents the freedom that he's lost. Mm -hmm. Sounds great. Let's hear it. Philip okay. Latham. Oh, I'm sorry. The Surrey Hills Barfly. <laughs> Thank you. I hear the train are coming. It's rolling around the bend. And I ain't seen sunshine since I don't know when. I'm stuck in Folsom Prison, and time keeps dragging on. But that train keeps rolling down to San Antonio. When I was just a baby, Mama told me, son, Always be good, but and don't ever play with guns. But I shot a man in Reno just to watch him die. When I hear that whistle blowing, I hang my head and There's rich folks eating from fancy dining car. They're probably drinking coffee and smoking big cigars. Well, I know I had it coming. I know I can't be free. But those people keep moving. That's what tortures me. If they freed me from this prison, if that railroad train was mine, bet I'd move it on a little farther down the line, far from Folsom Prison. That's where I want to stay. And I'd let that lonesome whistle blow the blues away. Where's my pal? Is it dollars? Australian dollars. Hold on. Let me get my Australian dollars. I think I still have some from when I was visiting. There you go. There you go. That's for you. <laughs> so um, Thank, that was played on my you. little Marshall stack. That's right. That was his Marshall stack. Philip, I think that's yeah, the first time you and I played music in 30 years. No, maybe in 29 years. That's the first time you and I played music together. <laughs> oh, you were playing along. Yeah, it's just kind of driving to my. I can't not, especially that song. You can't not play along to that song. That's like one of my favorites. In fact, uh, you can't see, but I've got a drum kit here at my place, and I wow. have a big 
framed picture of Johnny Cash right over my drum kit. So yeah, man, got to keep it real. So there's one more thing. We're about at time. It's been so nice to talk to you, but I know that you had something for show and tell. Would you mind sharing uh, an early picture of you and I with our friends? He's got stuff to show and okay. tell. He's got a lot of stuff. This is actually a picture of you, Mia. <laughs> Playing the drums. Look and how look, less you, tattoos I have, right? I have like hardly any. I know. I, I was surprised because my memory of you was that you had lots of tattoos, but I think here's the here's the evidence you didn't have that many. Um, Not as many as I have. You've hardly aged a day, Mia, in thirty oh years. Oh my gosh! Thanks. Yes. That's funny. I, apparently, I'm still. <laughs> okay, so I currently have a white drum yeah. kit. And I'm wearing a black sleeve shirt. Well Apparently, I don't change. I haven't changed my clothes in thirty years either, Philip. <laughs> That's me from the same time with my uh, my 1959 Ibanez bass guitar that I bought in 1983 that I still have, and I still use uh, when I'm recording my backing tracks. I play analog bass into GarageBand. I took that picture of you. With, now, this was a party at your place in Seoul, mm -hmm. which was near Yonsei University. That's right. Um, I think it was owned by the university, and it was like a women's dormitory. There was so five there's you of playing us drums, in there. Yep. Playing bass. And the Korean guy there is none other than Mr. Kang sun -hae, who became a famous pop star in Very famous, South Korea yes. after we left. And on the back of this photo, I've actually got a handwritten inscription so you can't do this these days at digital, which I wrote myself, which says, me are on drums, son A. And you know how I spelled son A? I spelled it son A, E, H. <laughs> son A <laughs> on guitar, me on bass at a party in Seoul. Son A has one album out already and he wants us to play on his next one. It must have been after a few beers at the party that he said that. And it's dated January 1991. So there Jeez you go. Louise. Wow, I don't even remember him <laughs> asking us to play in this. That's great. He became a very famous pop star. But yeah, so from the archives, thank you for indulging us, friends, watching. You get to see two old people, two middle aged people recollect their rock and roll past, but we're still doing it. So, Philip, Sir Latham, thank you so much for joining me and sharing your insights and a lot of very well-researched information about Sydney, Australia, and Australia, the pandemic and Black Lives Matter down there. So thank you so much. It's been a pleasure to talk to you. Any last words we say before we sign off? Um, one of my mottos in life is never stop listening to old music and never stop listening to new music. It's been a oh, I don't know if Philip's frozen or if I'm frozen. But from my end, pleasure, yeah. oh, there you are. Okay. I don't know if that's my bad connection or yours. Apologies either way. But, um, well, we're not having a very good connection. So thank you so much for watching, everyone. Um, like my Facebook page. Sign up on my uh, YouTube channel. And if you want to support the ongoing uh, series of this, I've got information on how you can do that in the description by, with this video. So take care, everyone. Philip, take care, sir. Thank you. Bye, ma'am.